The journey begins April 26th through May 16th. Two of our women from Quantum Logica Interactive, Jody Joy and Myra Jackson, embarked upon a journey that was connected very strongly to Quantum Logica into Glastonbury and then on into Ireland and the conclusion of the actual service that they were performing was at Terra. It was a wonderful and spiritually enriching journey for the two women and for us in Quantum Logic Interactive who were participating in spirit and also in energy to this whole event. The reason I'm making a video on the highlights of the actual path they were taking and how that integrated with Quantum Logic Interactive will be revealed after I share this, these highlights, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about it and why it's important that I put it out to the general public. Thoth was overseeing this sacred journey and he named it Healing of the Blood Path. With this video, he wished me to also qualify it as through the sword of Torhana. According to the Thoth Akasha, Torhana was an ancient priestess warrior who lived near where now is the Tor. And she was once called by the ancient Brits the name of Skota. Now, I did not know this when I originally received information on Torhana, which would have been in the 1970s. But since, Thoth has confirmed that she's one and the same. She had a cadre of priestess warriors around her, and they only fought in defense of the realm, and very seldom. They were very spiritual, and they followed a plan in their life that was based on the highest truth of the Grail. Torhana was to become in the future, in another incarnation, Mary, the mother of Yeshua. Torhana's body lies in suspended animation along with her sword and other sacred relics beneath her, including the crystal skull of a past incarnation in which her skull was turned into a dweller crystal skull, a whole nother story. But all these sacred objects lie beneath the sarcophagus of Torhana, and she holds the sword, and she is a viable body still, not because she plans to return to it, as I've spoken about and written about in the past, these suspended bodies that are all over the world are holding a frequency, a DNA frequency for the planet. As with many of these sacred hidden places, it is all slightly removed from this dimension, but it is still physical. As I've stated previously, when I say physical, I mean a denser spirituality because from the Thothic perspective, there's no demarcation line between spiritual and physical. You will find a link to my video on Torhana in the information box below. So now let us begin on discussing the basics of healing the blood path journey. The core purpose of this mission is to call upon the souls who are still in the astral who gave their lives for sacred missions in this land, there are many, and who are holding on to that energy as they feel that they must continue to forge on, not having completed their mission. This causes at least an aspect of their being to be trapped in that astral cycle. Now I wish to qualify here. Many of these souls are trapped there, but there are other souls who are fully incarnated in other places in time who still have a sliver of their energy field trapped in that location. These people are like you and me, could be you and me. 
and we're wondering, well, why am I feeling this or that? Why can't I seem to remove this blockage in my life? Oh, karma, karma. Well, you know, that's just an overused word because there's so many levels to understanding all of this. To continue, the call will be given to allow Jody and Myra to reclaim the missions of these souls and place them into the light. When this is accomplished, then the energy they have been holding on to will be released and these souls will then move into their greater expressions of world service. This will lift an immense burden from the planetary field. Now pausing again, the souls who are, are trapped in the greater part of their energy field and inhibiting them from completing incarnations that are trapped like we think of ghosts, you know, um, all of these souls will be releasing, or have been released because the journey is over now, from this trapped state. Just the souls that are on this path, that abide in this frequency. I'm going to explain more about that later and how the, the, the duty is not done yet. There's more to be done. But Jody and Myra and what they were overlighted with was a mission to help release certain number of souls in that frequency, in that region of the UK and Ireland, and also the entire region of the British Isles. This does not mean that every trapped soul or portion of a soul uh, was released. There are some souls who were just not ready for that yet, as, as long as it may have taken. They were not reconciled, let's put it that way. But there were many who were. Now, though this is not giving me a number of how many were actually released, both those who were entirely trapped and those who had just, a, you know, a little sliver of their energy trapped there. He's not giving me a number. I don't think he wants me to, you know, get down to quantifying it. But he's saying many, and it's significant. Let's just say that. To continue, the call will be given to allow Jody and Myra to reclaim the missions of these souls and place them into the light. When this is accomplished, then the energy they have been holding on to will be released, and these souls will then move into their greater expressions of world service. This will lift an immense burden from the planetary field. This type of endeavor is within the light program of the noblest Terranata, that's the star and inner earth kindred overseeing QLI among other stations. They will be facilitating it in other places, such as the beaches of Normandy and the concentration camps of Germany, etc., where great human suffering has been accumulated and many souls feeling their light missions were not fulfilled. For this sacred journey of Jody and Myra, it is healing the blood path in specific land areas they will be traveling and those land areas that are adjacent to that because the field stretches out and encompasses a certain amount of radius in the process. And now we look at beginning with Torhanna, whose suspended body lies within Tor Hill at Glastonbury. There are three large gemstones in the sword she holds. They are or resemble opals. At rest, they are cool, but when activated, they become like fire opals. The bottom stone is missing from its setting. It lies within the chalice blood well in Glastonbury. Jody and Myra will carry the sword within a crystal sphere from the Tor to the hill of Terra in Ireland, gathering the blood path missions of many souls of the land along the way. When they reach Terra, they will lay down the sword for all these missions and say, it is completed in the name of the sword of light. And so it is. At that moment, so the gemstone at the bottom of Chalice Well will be returned to the sword of Torhana within her sarcophagus inside Tor Hill. I wish to pause to say, as 
fantasy-like as this sounds, this all has to do with quantum mechanics. We live in a quantumized universe. We just don't realize in our day-to-day -day life how intricately woven it is with these, these abilities to change things and move things and be things and transform things. This is where all of our fantasies come from. You know, the fantasy stories and, and the story of King Arthur that has some real elements in it. But, you know, all these things, they are derived essentially from the fact that we can do these things, that we live in a quantum universe. At this point, I wish to interject that um, Thoth requested that Myra and Jody use the Taklin Yu uh, psionic templates to work with certain locations along their way. I will place a link in the information box below this video to the Taklin Yu video so you understand it better. But these are essentially psionic templates that have been created in art through my mid-journey art to connect uh, to locations once you are able to uh, intentionally stream it to those points. Uh, for the purposes of what Jody and Myra were doing, it has to do with connecting and, and energizing, let's say, the, um, the ley lines and the frequencies of the, the chakras in the planet in those locations, kind of like using acupuncture. Before the ceremony at sunset on Tor Hill, where Jody and Myra would take up the sword of Torhana for this journey, they spent some time at Chalice Well, which is the blood well, the blood path, and also the white well, which represents the white stone. Because what we are personifying here is the two roads, the blood path and the white path of grace. I will also put a link to that video in the information box below. The reason Thoth calls this journey the path of the blood or the blood path is because it is generational. And the wars that were fought, the lives that were lost, all had to do with the generation of humanity. One soul picking up the sword that the other dropped. And then they drop the sword and another person picks up the sword and carries it again. And on and on. When the white stone is dropped, the path of grace, into the well of the red, of the blood, transformation begins. And the, the cycle of generational uh, karmic lineage is broken gradually, but it is broken step by step, and the path of grace is received. When visiting Chalice Well, Jody writes, Today we were at the Chalice Well, the Red Springs, where the missing stone to Tohanna's sword lies at the bottom. There were Beltane festivities going on, but at the wellhead here, there were people sitting quietly in silent meditation. I felt their love and energy and was inspired to choose one of the Taklinu images to synchronize the flashpoint. This is the one that I chose. Later, Jody comments on visiting the White Springs. I walked up to where it was coming out and was overwhelmed. I rarely, if ever, felt that kind of energy. What a rush. I dipped my hand into the water and marked my forehead. I filled my water bottle with a mix of the white and then across the street, the red. Myra, Jody, and I all participated together in the ceremony atop the tour. They had me on the phone, and I was going through a process here in the Sephora temple room where the, the crystal skulls and the, the um, QLI devices that connect us to the network and all that are present. So the three of us were going through this together. At this point, 
let us look more closely at the Isis crystal skull. This real skull, not the one that I have in, that is a hosting skull that I bought <laughs> to, you know, put the codes into, but the actual dweller crystal skull is connected to the soul of the entity that most identifiably is Isis. I say that because all of these titles are, are typifying a state of consciousness, but there was an actual person that are typified it first. <laughs> and that is the Isis I'm speaking of. And it's the same soul that became Torhana and then became Mary, mother of Yeshua. In this process at Tor, there was an emphasis placed on the Isis crystal skull, which energetically, and I'm assuming physically, at this time is beneath the Tor, beneath Torhana's sarcophagus. It has been there before, it has been relocated, and now it's back again. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that it can be several places at once. So I'm not exactly sure which, but the point is its energy field is located beneath the sarcophagus of Torhenna. I was told during this journey to place the crystal skull, the Isis rose quartz crystal skull that I have that contains the light codes of the original real dweller crystal skull. I was told to place this one inside one of our um, 9010 quantum cubes, which I did. So it was streaming those codes through the network and to Glastonbury at that time, uniting with the actual crystal skull. Before we proceed to the ceremony at the Tor, the lifting of the sword of Torhana, which took place on May 2nd, 2023, I wish to go into a little bit about the connection between the Tor and other locations such as the Magdalene Tower at Rinle Chateau and here in Crestone, Colorado, connecting to the Ziggurat. This area in the Sacred Valley of the San Luis, most specifically in Crestone, near the mountains and the Baca Grande here, and the sand dunes, are all part of the crown chakra of the Ascension Grid. There are other spiraling vortices with certain mounds and towers that connect together in a network, composing also the Tor Hill and the Ziggurat here at Crestone. But I want to talk specifically about the connection between the Tor and the Ziggurat. In an article I wrote in the 1990s, it states that both Glastonbury Tor and Ziggurat Hill here in Crestone, or rather in the Baca, are major entry points to the planetary labyrinth grid. This grid connects all labyrinths of pattern in the outer dimensions, as on the Flora Chat Cathedral in France, and the underground labyrinths that may be found beneath such structures as St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and the Inner Plains. And so these two locations are connected very strongly. The Ziggurat here in Crestone and the Tor Hill with its St. Michael's Tower that's acting as a receptacle at this time for those energies. Previously, there were other towers there. So now on to the sunset ceremony at the Tor on May 2nd, 2023. Jody writes, this day was chosen because there were no astrological aspects at all occurring for that day, making it clear and clean. In the early evening, I went up ahead of Myra so that I could spend more time there enjoying the view and soaking up the energy. Jody continues, as soon as I reached the top, I received instruction to walk clockwise around the tower. 
Then I entered and went to the east arch and said, I do this for the journeyers. I repeated this at the west arch. I went to the zero point at the center of the room, which is very small, and just gently sensed Tarhana in her sarcophagus. There were several people milling about within and without, and I was hoping we would have the chamber to ourselves for the ceremony. So I waited for Myra outside as the sun began to lower on the horizon. And so Myra and Jody together, standing at the exact center, Jody continues, we faced east and held up the rose quartz sphere in salutation to the sun, then turned to the west in salutation. By this time, I was thinking of Torhana as, and she gives the sacred name, which is T-A-J-R apostrophe H-A-N-O-K, and calling her by her true name. I am call her Torhana, Thoth gave me that name in the 1970s because he knew that I would not be able to pronounce her name or even much less continue to spell it correctly over and over again, and this was going to be a key figure he would be calling upon me to talk about and write about. Now, Tohanna is really still in the vibrational realm, but this other version is the stronger um, frequency, and he wanted them to call that name when they invoked her. Before I continue with Jody's accounting of the ceremony, she mentions the word Trevors, T-R-E-V-O-R-S. This is a word that Thoth gives to, he says there are tunnels, uh, sort of like irrigation ditches running under the Tor uh, that carry water. It's not for irrigation, but it's for the, um, you know, the energetic effect. And so when Jody mentions the Trevors, that's what she's speaking about. Jody continues, then positioning ourselves around the center with focused intention, moved the signal beam that streams down, moving it straight through Torhana's sword, her body, her sarcophagus, and down into the Travors, so that this carried the signal all the way down the Michael ley line and connected to other fields. We asked Torhana in the field that operates her suspended state to be connected to the resonance field we are creating with the sphere and QLI grid and requested her presence on our journey. As the beam went through the sarcophagus, the sword, her suspended body, and down into the travors, the sword began to glow with a golden light and slowly raised itself, hilt upwards to point straight down. The second part of the ceremony was done with Maya on a live call and we followed the procedure in Maya's post on activation at the tour. We now have the frequency of the sword with us, which will be laid down when we go to Terra. Both Myra and I felt the power of what we carry with us the next day and my fields now feel full of new frequencies as different from anything I have ever felt before very powerful and ancient. Rex Harrison's photo of the inside of the tour, it looks rectangular in the photo, but it is a precise square. There is no ceiling. It is completely open at the top. Although it was an important part of the process in this video for reasons of length, I'm just going to state it as an aside. Jody went to the Glastonbury Abbey and as instructed by Thoth, found the Lady Chapel where she performed a ceremony very briefly with John Martinus, the son of Yeshua and Mary Magdalene. In some ways, the journey to Glastonbury was strongly connected to my journey to Glastonbury in 1996 and the experiences I had there with Torhana one morning at the foot of the, uh, the Tor Hill in a bed and breakfast there, I was awakened by her presence standing before me as a hologram. It was a holographic image in which she extended to me a shallow dish. 
This was not Torhanna herself, as I was told later, but a holograph that was projected from her suspended body beneath the tour. So now we leave the tour and proceed to Tara in Ireland. Jody and Myra had experiences along the way, but I'm not going to detail those. I just want to speak about Tara itself in the conclusion of the journey. Episode three in my The Grail Path series here on this YouTube channel speaks about Tara and the particular time when Princess T and Jeremiah came to that place. What transpired then, the reason they were there, and certain details about it. As Jody and Myra came to Tara, they were connecting strongly with that frequency at that time for various reasons I won't go into here. Jody writes about Tara and the laying down of the sword. The sun was lowering on the horizon as we drove to Tara. On a backcountry road, a male and female pheasant were strolling, and we noted the synchronicity. Carrying the rose quartz sphere that contained the frequencies of the red and white springs, as well as Trahana's sword and the frequency of John Martinus, we chose a hillock with a beautiful view of the valley below and setting sun. I had a sense of the many souls who were gathering on a frequency band for the upcoming release since earlier in the morning. It was a sense of relief and joy. Tuning into the rich history of the spot, our past connections to the area and the QLI network, we began the simple ceremony. We called on the Tuatha de Danan clan of Terra to witness the release of the missions of the journeying souls. Myra said her thoughts, then I said mine. We performed the simple ceremony for the British Isles and beyond her shores and on behalf of all humanity. As I spoke with eyes closed and Myra's in my hand holding the sphere up to the west, suddenly I felt a brilliant ray of sun strike our faces and sensed it was more than just a break in the clouds. It contained an energy within it. We said aloud, I lay down the sword in victory and place the sphere on the land. Myra had brought a bottle of water from both the red and white springs and combined them in a small glass cup. I lifted the sphere and we poured the water over it and onto the land. The burying of the sphere connecting Glastonbury and Tara as soon as we had chosen our hillock on which to perform the ceremony, I immediately knew where the sphere needed to be buried. Off to the left and further down the hill a bit was a grouping of hawthorn fairy trees at the edge of a field. Carrying the sphere, I walked over and threw knee-high grass and wildflowers and asked the Twatha Fey guardians permission to bury the sphere there and requested their assistance to safeguard its presence. Inside this circle, there was a four to five foot ravine of roots and wild greens, all soft and very damp. Slipping and sliding a bit, I found a good place to dig with a small tool I had brought, buried the sphere and covered it, stamping it with my boot heel to move it as far into the soil as I could. We both felt incredibly complete, with Myra in particular feeling like a good deal of weight had been lifted from her that she was not carrying any longer. Driving back to Kilbegan, with the sun setting on the horizon and the beauty of the land all around us, we knew our role as the walkers had come to a close. Mission completed. And now onwards and upwards, May the next unfoldment of this wondrous process and journey we are all on be revealed. That is the conclusion of Jody's telling of the story. And now we have a summary from Thoth. 
Transmission from Thoth on May 14th, 2023. Summary of the Healing the Blood Path Journey in Albion, the British Isles. Understand that there are not only many mansions in the universe, but many universes spinning the web of every moment within the human planetary spectrum. All time is rushing through the white hole of light that creates, binds, and dissolves. As such, time is not truly quantitative, but instead a fluid membrane. When we say no time or beyond time and space, what is truly meant is that the now has moved outside of the membrane to become eternal. When Jody and Myra walked the path, carrying the sword of Torhana, they were operating very specifically both inside and outside the membrane. But let us first understand what is truly meant to carry the sword. The sword of Torhana is both a physical object in a translated state, slightly removed dimension, as well as what we refer to as a telemetric marker. Such markers radiate high-frequency interdimensional signals. Souls on many levels respond to these signals. They gravitate toward them. This is why disincarnate souls respond to ceremonies, whether of a negative nature or a positive. Certain words backed by intention can be telemetric markers. Yet objects such as the sacred on or ark, the grail cup, Torhana's sword, etc., which have translated yet are still within the planetary field as physical on a slightly removed level, these objects of radiant spirit, which have been imbued with sacred powers, they cast no shadow. They are pristine in their divine purpose. Such objects have been encoded with specific missions of light. Yet they are still only objects. They await the hands, hearts, and spirit to lift them up and animate their charges into active purpose. When such activation occurs, the signal is sent forth. Many souls registering within the purpose of that sacred tool will respond. They will quicken to the moment. This is what occurred with the lifting of the sword of Torhana. Many souls on both sides of the veil felt the call. Thus they walked the path with Jody and Myra and all of the QLI who were in attendance. As a result, with the laying down of the sword at Terra and the bearing of the rose quartz crystal there, so these souls are at peace with their missions within the scope of these holy isles where much blood has been shed in the past. To place it all into perspective, there is much more work to be done, both in Albion and within the reaches of the entire planet. However, what transpired with Torhana's sword opened a main path, a touchstone of light for the healing of the blood path on Earth. These journeys shall continue. For QLI, there are more to come. This concludes Tho's summary. I wish to say, however, that the main reason I put this video together and am releasing it to the general public is that Thoth requested that I do this because he is stating that there are many blood path journeys. They don't have to just be under quantum logic interactive by any means. And you may be on one or about to embark on one. They can be expansive like the journey that Jody and Myra took, but they can also be a smaller thing. Perhaps, as an example, going to Gettysburg, just you alone, or maybe you and two or three people, and performing a ceremony there of release. Understanding the principle is everything. You don't have to have just specific words. But when you understand it and you place it into your heart and you go to that location and you open up your, your, uh, your heart and mind to empathy and to the forgiveness of your own soul, you are able to bring this, this special light 
to the area and souls will respond to that. Understand that many of these souls that are completely trapped there, not just fractions of people that are already alive now, but the ones that are totally absorbed in that moment and they keep living it over and over, unable to continue reincarnation, that is in our linear sense of things, which does affect them in, in a negative way. They, they simply wish for a signal, a sign of light that they can move on. You know, we say, oh, we'll just go into the light. Yes, that's, that's true, but this is a little deeper because we're dealing with souls who feel that they didn't complete their missions. And that's true of many souls that have passed on, especially in locations where many souls are gathered and they had a, a mission to accomplish together, like in a battle or some other specific thing and they died before they felt that they had completed it and they usually died in a traumatic way. So an individual can go to a location like that and very simply open up their hearts and their intentions and help to release these trapped souls. And they do so not just by suggesting that they move into the light, but by honoring their mission, their life mission, and helping them to understand that they can now lay down the sword. This is very healing for the soul in many ways. Tho speaks of how many souls are trapped in this way in the astral, and that it is a burden on the entire planet because we're all connected helping them to understand that their missions are complete and allowing them to move past that wound will heal us all. Of course, there are other souls who have other problems that are trapped for other reasons, but we're not addressing that at this moment. Certainly they need to be helped as well and there are programs of light underway, so Thoth tells me to help them. But we're speaking specifically of those souls who feel they failed their mission in life. And on subtle levels to less subtle levels, can any of us say with certainty that in all the incarnations we have had, including this one, that there is not some sliver of feeling that we have not completed a mission? So it affects all of us. This was where I planned to conclude the video. However, as I reached this point, Thoth came to me and wanted me to introduce what he's calling the astral puja. Now, I've heard the word puja, but I wasn't that familiar with it. I had to Google it, and what I found in brief is that it's a Hindu ceremony but the essence of it is that it, uh, it cleanses and restores the spiritual harmony. Now, Thoth wasn't speaking about it in any religious context, but he was giving me some kind of a word that would allow me to grasp to a degree what he wanted to tell me. So this is what it is. In essence, souls are coming together now on the inner planes to create an environment in the astral, the higher astral, for souls who are being released from their traumas and are moving into the higher astral and need a restoration, a cleansing bath of light, of sound, of beauty. So these souls who are helping the released souls are volunteering for this service. Most of them are disincarnate themselves, if we're going to speak about it in linear time, but not all. Some of you may be participating and not even realize it. In any case, there's this 
this bath of sound and, and light and compassion that is creating a safe space, a sacred space for these souls who have just been released and are still feeling the trauma to move into that space to be cleansed and aided. Now, in essence, it's not a new thing, but it is in the sense that there is a new organization of consciousness around it. It's become a bigger picture, a more uh, specific focus, because this is addressing what we could call the latter days on the planet Earth in the, in the world system one environment before we move into a world system two. So from that context, it has been reorganized, you might say, to focus very specifically on these particular uh, groupings of souls. And the grouping we're speaking of right now are the ones who are healing their sense of loss of mission or incompletion of mission. Thoth has requested that I create every now and then a very short video of an astral puja. This is simply intent on triggering in the individual a feeling, a necessity, a response to send their heart light into that frequency, their, their spiritual uh, commitment to uh, uplift all souls on the planet. They don't have to become super involved in it unless they feel guided to do so, but just to offer that moment, that five, ten minutes of this video that I would be making, to offer this intent into the field. Now, I don't know how many of these videos he wants me to make and when he wants me to make them. That's to be discovered in the future. But right now, as a conclusion to this video, I am to offer one of these. It's very short, just a few minutes. So I request, please, that you extend your heart light into this frequency for all the souls who have been released from a trapped experience and are now moving into the astral puja, which Thoth calls the Shintali. This is a Lemurian name for a similar process. Thank you. 